Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Advanced Hour Chemistry. Um, we're going to have a look at a couple of questions today. We're going to answer two questions, which I know um, have been... Keep on, you can start my stopwatch for myself here because I don't want to ramble on too long in this one. Um, what are the two questions that I'm going to answer today? Number one, um, what have spiders and horseshoe crabs got in common? Uh, and what's it got to do with oxidation numbers? Uh, and you as well, in fact, and me, come to that. Um, and question two, which is... Um, one that nobody much asks all the way back in fourth year. How come reduction is a gain of electrons? What's that about? So that's the two questions today. Um, blood and oxidation numbers, which sounds like a great combination. Um, let's start with what an oxidation number is, first of all. So uh, this is our first concept, uh, oxidation numbers, sometimes called oxidation states. It's more or less the same thing. These are great questions the SQA loves to slot in for just one or two marks, um, but are also fundamental to our continued existence and being able to breathe, in fact. Uh, what is an oxidation state? Effectively, here's what it is. It's the same as the charge it would be if the thing you're dealing with is an isolated ion. That's not a great description, is it? Um, let's have some examples. Let's have some examples. So, for example, in a sodium ion in a form of sodium chloride, then the oxidation state is just one. Duh. And so is the chloride ion. So, not very challenging. Um, what happens when you get something like this, though? We're going to wander into oxidation states and transition metals. I introduced transition metals at the, last, uh, the, the end of the last video. Um, we had a look at the way that electrons stacked up, which were relatively predictable with two slightly odd examples. Go back and have a look if you haven't had a look at that video yet. One of the things the oxidation sorry, one of the things the transition metals can do is they can have a variable oxidation state. Now that's a nice trick. Because if you if you identify the oxidation state as effectively the charge on the ion, then this of course is set as one plus forever, and this is set as one minus. These guys here, they're much more flexible in their outlook. Um now, that means that there is no instant recall. Oh, yeah, the valency of the transition metal. That's why they don't have a fixed valency either, because they don't have a fixed charge. Their charge can vary, and therefore so can their valency. So how are you supposed to figure it out, then? Well, I've got here a few rules, which are I'm stealing from the Scholar document. Um, and we can use these rules to figure out the valency, the charge, the oxidation state. It's all the same thing of a transition metal um, in a given situation. For example, um, let's say we have got this ion here, uh, MnO4, 1 minus, so beloved of me in class because I get to play air guitar to deep purple, of course. Um, now the question is, what's the oxidation number of the manganese? Well, if we apply these rules here, Oxidation number of an uncombined element is zero. I don't see any uncombined elements there, so we can forget that one. For charges containing single atoms, that's monatomics, that's the sodium chloride I just showed you. This isn't, this is much more complex. In fact, if you've been with me further down the school, I call these complex ions, and you're going to see exactly why I call them complex ions in about one video's time. Uh, in most compounds, oxidation of, oh, sorry, the oxidation number of oxygen is minus two. I'm seeing four minus twos here. Brilliant. Um, hydrogen is plus one. Doesn't apply here. The sum of all the oxidation states in the atom in a molecule or a neutral compound. This is not a molecule or a neutral compound. So let's skip on to the last one. The sum of all the oxidation numbers in a polyatomic ion. Yep, that's what I've got. Bingo. Must add up to the charge on the ion. Now, that is a long-winded way of saying that whatever the oxidation number of this is, we'll call it X, if you add it to the combined oxidation number of these four oxygens, so that's four lots, negative two, that sum must be equal to the, com the charge on the ion, which is minus one. So solve for X, and you get X equals seven. Okay, so that is the oxidation number of manganese in this permanganate or MnO4 1 minus ion. That's how you do these guys. 
if we pick, um, let's pick another one that you would have come across at higher. Let's pick dichromate. Um, CR207. So useful for oxidizing alcohols. And it's got that beautiful iron brew color as well. Uh, I don't suppose anybody outside Scotland is watching this, but if you are, you probably have no idea what iron brew is. Um, so what's the oxidation state of the chromium here? Well, uh, the oxidation, uh, we don't know, so let's call it X. By the way, you notice there's two of them here, so we'll actually call it 2X. 2X plus, there's seven oxygens here. So seven times negative two. That all comes to negative two, which is the charge. You notice, by the way, that that is not the oxidation number. It's nothing like it, in fact. Um, so we've got 2x equals what we got is 7 times minus 2. So 2x equals 12, therefore x equals positive 6. So that's what an oxidation state is, guys. Um, can I answer my first question, by the way? Or one of my questions. Can I answer the fact why reduction is gain of electrons? Um, there's a relatively simple answer to this, and it's just possibly never you've never realised it before. If we have um, MnO4, let's take this from higher, uh, 1 minus, uh, gets changed into Mn2+. This is why, by the way, I said last year in higher, if you were in my class, you can't compare these charges, because this is no longer attached to anything else here. It's by itself. So we need the oxidation number of the manganese itself to start with. Um, let's complete the, the rest of this uh, balanced equation, by the way. We'd have four H2Os, we would have eight H pluses, um, and if I remember correctly, we need five electrons on this side. Yep, that's good. We're good to go. Now, this means the, per the permanganate ion is combining with five electrons here, so it's gaining these five electrons, and last year we said that this was reduction. And everybody nodded their head, yep, but gaining reduction? How's that? Well, I'm hoping you'll be able to shout at the screen and tell me now, because we have just figured out that the oxidation state, effectively, if this was by itself, it would be like Mn7+. That would be its effective charge, and now it's only Mn2+. Oh, look what's happened to the charge. It has reduced. That's why it's called reduction, guys, because you're reducing the oxidation state down from 7 plus to 2 plus. Um, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today. It's going to be a briefer video this time because I'm squeezing in a couple of apparently random concepts. This oxidation state concept, what's that got to do with keeping you alive, by the way? Um, the answer is because when your iron, the iron in your body um, combines with oxygen, it changes its oxidation state. And then when that haemoglobin molecule floats around to, say, one of your brain cells and drops the oxygen off again, it changes back to its original oxidation state. So the fact that transition metals can have variable oxidation states is responsible for your continued existence. Um, something that's quite cool um, is the fact that not every blood system is based on iron as a transition metal. If you're a horseshoe crab or a spider, one of the arachnids, then your blood is in fact based on copper and is bluey green. How cool is that? If you're a spider watching this video, by the way, I'm most impressed. Um, pause this for just two seconds. Sorry folks, dry throat. Um, could I have one callback, another callback to higher of course, which is, if you remember, re reducing agents and oxidizing agents. Um, they had that sort of weird, you know, they, they worked the reverse of what you would think. A reducing agent caused something else to be reduced. It was doing the reducing on something else, so therefore it itself gets oxidised. Um, our deep purple, I should have a purple pen for this, shouldn't I? should have written this in purple. Sloppy, hey? So our nice deep purple permanganate gets reduced, so therefore it was an oxidising agent. Which makes perfect sense if you think about it. Um, that's the last thing I want to talk about in this. I would like to talk about um, my s my second uh, thing, which is apparently, once again, a slightly random um, concept, but you'll need it for what's coming up in the very near future.
Excuse me, I need a fresh sheet of paper. I've run out of paper. Excuse me. Uh, sorry, folks, in my infinite muppetry, I managed to uh, forget to include this part originally. So, we're back again. Um, I would like to cover a concept called dative bonding. That's D-A-T-I-V-E. Dative bonds. What on earth are they? They're going to solve a very old mystery, um, dating all the way back to National 5, when, if you remember correctly, if you had ammonia, it was defined as a base. And a base is something that reacts with hydrogen ions and absorbs them. So we got this reaction here. So ammonia molecules changed into ammonium ions. And everybody went, uh huh, uh, and then moved on. And yet this, this was so different to the other three categories of base. How can this work anyway? What's this about? Um... A data bond. I want to explain what it is. I want to explain what there's one forming right here in front of your eyes. Um, this won't take long though. Um, and it's linked to uh, what ligands can do. What's a ligand? <laughs> That's because I'm filming this after I filmed the complex ions. You don't know what a ligand is yet? Don't worry, I'm time travelling. Wait till you get to the next film, then all will become clear. So what is the definition of a data bond? It's basically a covalent bond. Not uh, very interesting there. However, it's different to a normal covalent bond. If we recap just a second, we have a hydrogen atom here, a hydrogen atom here, one electron from this one, one electron from this one, everybody's hunky-dory. Um, a data bond... Oops, looks like a bit polarised there. Sorry about that. That's better. A data bond is a covalent bond where both of the electrons came from one of these atoms involved. So both of the electrons are from a single atom. Now, let's take a wee look at this guy in more detail here. Um, sorry, sorry. Uh, a nitrogen atom. One, two, three, four, five. He says, not setting up the diagram in any convenient way whatsoever. Let's pop three hydrogens on here. And I know life is a lot more complex than that now, but let's just flash back to uh, uh, an easier time when we find that there are two electrons that are not involved in these covalent bonds. They're just sitting around twiddling their thumbs. Uh, along comes a hydrogen uh, ion, which is basically just a proton, more or less, in space. Although, I hate to say this, but once we come to the physical chemistry section, you'll realise that that's a misrepresentation. But that's okay. We'll go into the truth behind hydrogen ions. Do you really think individual protons could just float about in a glass? I don't think so. Um, so a, a hydrogen ion comes along, it's got a one plus charge, of course, one proton, and it sticks to your ammonia atom. Uh, ammonia molecules, I do apologise. Um, I've been wrong footy by having to re-record this video. You can see we're from the covalent bond, you can see both the electrons in this covalent bond came from the nitrogen. Does the, uh, does the bond care? Not in the slightest. There's a couple of ways to represent a, co a dative covalent bond. It can sometimes be shown as this. Indicating, of course, that the electrons came from the nitrogen to the hydrogen. But that, in my opinion, is sort of a waste of time because as soon as this bond is formed, it's completely indistinguishable in length and bond strength from any of these other three bonds. So therefore, effectively, we just have this. We just have a tetrahedron. The whole thing has a one plus charge. One of these bonds was unusual in its formation, but now it's been formed, nobody cares. So that's what a date of bond is, guys. By the way, if you're wondering where the charge came from, you can do the sums. If you add up the number of protons in this entire molecule and the number of electrons in this entire molecule, you find you're one more proton than an electron, and that's why the charge is one plus. And an easier way to look at that, and this is a handy technique for later, is to look at the fact that on the left-hand side here, you've got a no charge and one plus, so therefore the overall charge is one. The overall charge on this side needs to be the same at one plus. Uh, and as a quick uh, review of this concept, data bond is a covalent bond. However, both of the electrons in the bond came from one of the atoms involved. Who cares? Well, we're going to care in the next video because the two concepts that I've explained to you today, which are oxidation number and data bonding, are both involved in forming what's called um, complex ions involving transition metals. Um, I think I started to talk about blood, didn't I? Maybe in the other oxidation numbers video. It's been a couple of days now, a couple of weeks now since I did it. Um, and uh, iron, everybody knows blood's based on iron, isn't it? 
Well, do you think you have Fe2 plus ions floating around in your blood? Do you not think that'd be just a wee bit on the toxic side? Is there some arrangement between organic molecules and transition metal ions? Can they bond with each other in some fashion? We'll maybe come back to that. In fact, well, not maybe. We will come back to this next week in the next lesson and the next video. Thank you for that, folks. Bye-bye.